Jesus. You may be seated for just a moment. Thank you, Lord. Me and uh, Brother Terrence was talking just, I don't know, an hour or two before church. I was going to pick up Colton from baseball practice. And uh, as him and I were talking about a few things, I couldn't help but have something begin to play over in my mind. And I told Brother Terrence, I said, the Bible says that Jesus went about healing. All those that come to him that were broken, all those that were weary, he healed every single one of them. Every one of them. He, he got some spit together and he put it on a man's eyes. He stuck his ears in one man, in his ear, or his fingers in one man's ears and put some spit and put it on his tongue. And if I think about that now, Brother Ronnie, I'm like, man, that's kind of disgusting. But how would I feel if I was that blind? How would I feel if I had never saw a day in my life or I had never heard a day in my life and then all of a sudden I met the master who opened my eyes and opened my ears and now for the first time in my life I saw the sky. And for the first time in my life I heard a baby cry. And for the first time in my life I got to hear a bird sing. I dare say that I would be able to just sit there and say, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. But something would begin to burn inside of me, and a, a praise that once was not there would begin to well up inside of me, that I couldn't sit any longer in a place of normal. But I realized that I had been touched by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I had to have that same mentality every single time that I walked into this place. Amen. I have to have that same mentality every breath that I breathe because I'm not promised tomorrow. But I stand here today with an opportunity to magnify him. I stand here today with a chance to praise him and to glorify him because he woke me up this morning and he started me on my way. He gave me strength to get through my day. He gave me breath in my lungs to open my mouth and magnify him. He gave me two hands that I could wave and lift them unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He gave me two feet that I could walk into this place tonight. He is worthy of every single bit of my praise. Now what am I going to do with it, Sister Maria? Am I going to praise it or am I going to just sit here? I want to, to realize in this place tonight that I have the opportunity to magnify him, to praise him. made it a point to be here, and I'm thankful, like I said a while ago, that he's here, amen? amen. So one more time, let's just give him a hand clap of praise, and thank you for your statement for this mercy, because he is truly worthy of all praise, amen? Sister Heidi, if you put the way to get home the board tonight, <clears throat> we have Givelify and PayPal available at riverbendpentecostal.com. Give your cash and checks to be mailed to Ruth Ben Pentecostal's P.O. Box 477, Commander, Missouri, 63869. We have the text to give, which is 833-883-9311. All of you that's doing it the old-fashioned way, we have the offering that's closest to it and the tithe that's on the outside here. So if you will, I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. We're going to pray it like we mean it. Amen? Y'all believe a prayer works? I believe a prayer works. Ain't nothing magical about it, but it's obedience. Amen? Amen. So let's pray this tonight with some authority. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Press down, shaken together, and running over. I'm a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, and the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs. Raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, 
It's demolished and royalty received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come and heal with what the Lord has blessed you with this time.
Brother Terrence, there was a lot of broken people that he encountered on his way. Told you about how he anointed a man of God with flame mixed in his, some spit. But then I begin to think about a man by Brother Tripp, they called him the rich young ruler. He also had an encounter with Jesus. And his didn't turn out the same way. Brother Johnny, it seems like the broken ones came and they were willing to do anything it took. They allowed him to put clay on their eyes and spit on their eyes and spit on their tongue. But there was a man that had followed all the rules, that knew all the rules, that had a life of knowledge that he gleaned, probably at the hands of a minister or hearing the word of God. And he had learned how to do everything right. But when it came to giving all that he had, the Bible says in Trinity that he went away saw because he had great riches. So many times in our life when we're at the lowest point of our life and we're broken beyond repair, we hear the voice of the Lord. But when we think we've got it all together, we rely on our own wisdom and knowledge. We fail to give him the honor that's due his name. Amen. I never want to get to the place where I'm ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. I never want to get to the place where I hear what pastor's preaching, that I hear it, but I don't become a doer of the word. Because if I just hear it and I don't do it, then I'm not being obedient to what the Lord has called me to do. Amen? But we're about to hear a word from the Lord tonight. I want each and every one of you to just think, to listen, to receive the word, to allow it to fall on some good ground and to put it to use in your life tonight. Amen? And we can be changed. Because the end result is to take what we hear to learn to be more like him and to pour it into somebody else. Amen? Amen. That I can teach them how to follow the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and let them know that if he can change my life, he can change their life. Amen? Amen. That's what I want to be in this place. If I could have all of the kids, the Riverbend kids and the uh, Riverbend United to come up here tonight, we're going to pray over all of them. We're going to send them back on their way to these teachers. Let's pray for the teachers as well that God will bless them tonight. Use them to help teach these children. Because I believe that the word of God can live in them just like it lives in me. And he can pour into them and they can bless their, their classmates and their parents and their grandparents and change their life just like we can. Amen. Let's pray over them tonight. Lord Jesus, I love you, God, and I thank you for each and every one of these kids, Lord. I thank you for each and every one of these young people, God. I pray your manifold blessings upon each and every one of them, God, that you strengthen them, that you encourage them, and that you bless them. God, I know it seems like it, Lord, that we forget over what it was like to be a young person or a child, oh God. But I know they go through many struggles and worries and doubts and fears. But you're the one, God, that can deliver them and strengthen them. God, I believe you can call them, even at a young age, to be used of you. God, and your blessings and mercy would be upon them all of their days and their life. God, that you would strengthen them and bless them, God, to do what you call them to do. And we give you honor, praise, and glory for each and every one of them. I pray that your will be done in their life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, Red, lead them on back, buddy. Amen. It's a good bunch of young ones here tonight. As pastors come, let's just give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. And thank you for the opportunity to be in the house tonight. Amen.
Welcome into the system. Discuss just briefly. I don't want to stay long because uh, I, w- I want to be able to get through tonight. But uh, last week we presented two questions to you. Uh, one of them is think about a time when you wrestled with a biblical principle and uh, what helped you respond faithfully to the authority of the word. Did anybody think about that this week? Jennifer said she did. Anybody else? Sister Crystal said she did. Some of y'all don't know if you did or not. Uh, I, I, I uh, th- this is not about making me feel good, okay? This is about, is the word even messing with me? And you're going to find out tonight, the word is there to mess with you, to challenge you. That's the hands of the potter. Is the word, and uh, then I a second question. I was going to discuss this a little bit, but uh, Jennifer and I could have a discussion, and Sister Crystal and I could have a discussion, and the rest of y'all be left out. And I, I don't want anybody to feel bad, like nobody got invited to the party or something. So, uh, but the second question, and don't worry, I can teach enough to fill up the rest of the time. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Is there an area where the Word of God is challenging you right now? Now, I brought this back to you again, obviously. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm gonna, I know some folks are going to get ticked off tonight. I know that because I'm, I'm going to challenge. And I'm going to challenge some things you thought you knew since the ark. And I had to not challenge myself today. And some of this stuff is, some of this stuff, Sister Maria, I write it down. The Lord flows through me and I write it down. And then when I get in the flesh, I say, I ain't so sure I need to talk about that. (laughs) So uh, who's going to go? Uh, I guess the first question you need to ask yourself, have I ever wrestled with the biblical principle? Have I ever? Well, if you have, then you need to know how did I come through it and what was the outcome? And then, of course, is there an area where the word is challenging me? Let's review just a little bit. The word of God calls his disciples to be active readers of the word. More than just reaching into our minds, the word must show up in our bodies. When God speaks, all of creation does whatever he says. The trees, the rivers, the mountains. If he wants a mountain where there was a mountain, he'd just pop up one. Do you believe that? Okay. The fish do what he says. The lion does what he says. The zebra does what he says. The the tiger does what he says. The catfish out there in the middle of the water right now, he knows where every one of them are because they do what he says. The only creature that he made that does not have to do what he says is mankind. As we grow and mature in our relationship with God, we will find 
that our response to the word becomes less and less confrontational with our will and more and more formational, meaning we will find ourselves skipping over less and less verses because we just didn't really like what they said. You know the Bible that what you can do is when you read something you don't like, you know how you handle it? You either skip it or what do you say? What did you say, Sister Crystal? I don't understand it. And all of a sudden, I got a pass. Okay? Get ready. As we grow, we'll find out the word is less and less confrontational with our will and more and more formational, making us what he wants us to be. One of the measurements of this is when we are no longer always dealing with our past, but our future. We're taking new ground instead of fighting over old ground. This is what we call approaching the word with a transformational commitment. Is that word in your handout? Yeah, okay. Submitting ourselves to the word for the purpose of being transformed by the renewing of our mind, as Romans 12 and 2 tells us. The word transform, this is important. This is, this is reviewed from several times. The word transform, look it up in the dictionary. Look it up in the, it's from the word metamorpho, from the Greek word, and it refers to change that is evident on the outside. So that destroys the ideology that living for God only affects you on the inside. It shows up on the outside. It is change that is evident on the outside. But this is, of course, referring not only to how you look, but also how you speak and how you act. I will say this. It is a crying shame to look Pentecostal and act like the devil. But the Lord laid that on me today. That ain't in my notes. There are three questions we should ask ourselves every time we reach the Word. Is this familiar to anybody? It's what we talked last week. First thing we need to ask ourselves is what did I learn when I read the Word? Now, since I know that the ultimate purpose of Jesus Christ and the ultimate work of the Spirit in the lives of men is for what? Reconciliation, since I know it's for reconciliation, and reconciliation is restoring each one of us to the relationship with God that man was supposed to have before sin came in, right? Therefore, bringing us back to what? Created order. Very good, Brother Barry. You and Brother Johnny getting them, them uh, dumb, dumb suckers after the church. Therefore, when we are operating in the plan for reconciliation, we know that whatever we're doing for God is perfect and exactly what we should be doing And every ministry that is pointing others toward reconciliation is as essential as any ministry. There are no levels of importance when the lens you're looking through is reconciliation. You believe that the first time you speak to a guest, it is to help them be reconciled to God. Right? You meet them at the front door, smiling like a mule eating briars. Anybody ever seen a mule eating saw briars? Picture of it. They're smiling. That's right, brother. You want to give, give a demonstration for everybody? <laughs> Let me tell you another one. A dog eating peanut butter. Anybody ever seen that before? Mule eating saw briars and a dog eating peanut butter. They look about the same. The second, you understand that when we come to the house of God, we are in the ministry of reconciliation. Everybody that shows up to this place better see Jesus Christ in your mug, your grill, 
your face. Okay? It's the ministry of reconciliation. The second question we need to ask ourselves, and i got to move on quickly. What can I apply right now? What did I just read that I can apply right now? What principles or actions in accord with the leading of the Spirit can now be active in my life as a result of my submission to what I've read? I have to be aware that there will be a struggle between the Spirit and the flesh in this area. I will, and, and I, I don't, I don't want to hurt your feelings or anything, but if I gave you a couple of questions as homework, and only two people did it out of the whole church, then that means some of us have got a problem with being forgetful hearers. Wish I had a mic to drop. <laughs> Make sense? Huh? What, what are you doing? I feel the Holy Ghost so strong right now. What are you doing with what you've been given? Right. Some of you come to me service after service after service and say, that's blowing me away. This teaching is incredible. The things God's given us is incredible. Woo, it's blowing my mind. I can't stop thinking about it. But what in the world are you doing with it? Who's teaching a Bible study? Who's gone knocking on the doors of your neighbors? Who's gone to the nursing home? Who's trying to go to the jail? Who's trying to go to the school and start a P7 club? I, I'm not, this is not me and me. This is, I told you I was going to challenge you. Who sits at home all day doing nothing because you're retired and gets out of the phone book and just starts calling people and inviting them to church? I'm just giving you some ideas. I can't think of everything, but the truth is we get so wrapped up in Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and we get so wrapped up in, in who, who's, who's getting ready to start spring training and who won the NBA championship and whatever college is doing this, and we're not spending our time on who we are. ourselves when we read the word is how should I be praying? Initially, that seems to be a foolish question to ask. How should I pray? Everybody knows how to pray. You don't believe me? Let all hell break loose in your life. Atheists start praying when everything goes haywire in their life. 
Everybody knows how to pray. So why should I be asking, based upon what the Lord has shown me from his word, how should I pray? See, the prayer that everybody knows how to pray, oh, Lord, this is so powerful, is dictated by needs, wants, and other people's emergencies. I ask God for what I need, or what I want, or what my loved ones need, or want, or I pray about anything that provokes a compassionate response in me, meaning if you see on Facebook a poor little old bald-headed child that has lost all their hair because they've got cancer, compassion will cause you to go pray for somebody you don't even know based upon the need you just experienced. The reason why, this is jumping ahead, but it's true, the reason why many people lose faith in God is because he doesn't meet all their needs. As they have defined. The book says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Some of us are wanting things that aren't in the warehouse of glory. I'm going to prove this to you. And I'm going to get you right where the rubber meets the road in just a minute. Look here. Tonight, we're going to learn what it means to pray kingdom prayers. A concept, I'm going to hurry, I know you're tired. A concept, who said that? Bro, I don't even hardly know you, man. They don't think that I've got you in here as a ringer. <laughs> kingdom praying. Thank you, Danny. I appreciate that. We need to pray for Brother Jerry Pikey, too. He's got some trouble today. This concept that I'm about to share with you is going to be foreign to us at first, but it's going to make perfect sense as we unpack its principles. Because kingdom prayers is when you begin to pray from heaven's perspective and not your own. Some years back, Brother Lewis, or Dr. Lewis refers to this song in his book. I looked it up and it's legit. I didn't know it, but it's legit. There was a song released. I think the title of it was Pray For Me. I think. It's a country song. It's not a Christian song. But the, the theme of the song is praying for people that have wronged you. And the singer then sang a couple of the lines are, I pray that your brakes go out while you're going down the hill. <laughs> I pray that your birthday comes and nobody calls you. Now, it was done as a joke. You understand that. And nobody that's any kind of a follower of Jesus Christ would recognize that those prayers are not kingdom principles. They violate the principles of the kingdom of God to the point of being laughable. In the same vein, prayers that we pray that come from our fishes and loaves paradigm or are based strictly upon whatever need comes our when we hear about a need or we have a need, we automatically assume we're supposed to pray about it. The need dictates the prayer. Is that fair? Yeah. That also violates the principles of the kingdom of God. Any prayer that is built upon our purpose 
rather than God's purpose violates kingdom principles. Now please keep in mind, tonight we're teaching from a perspective of somebody who desires to grow. <clears throat> somebody that desires to possess the promise and the purpose for which they were created. We're not talking about people that just learning how to live for God. We're talking about people that want to grow past where they are. Now, kingdom praying, by its very nature, requires a death to self and includes a new life in Christ Jesus. Now, let's look at the Lord's Prayer. Because we can learn how to implement the components necessary for death to self and new life in Jesus Christ. You find this in other places, but Matthew 6, 9 through 13, and you don't even have to put that up there, Sister Heidi. But Jesus taught his disciples to pray in relationship with one another. How do we know that? There you go. The first word of the Lord's Prayer Brother Cody, many people would probably have said, I would have said, the first word in the Lord's Prayer is Father. Okay? Without even thinking, because that was the focus in my mind, was the Father. But the first word is our. And what that word our does, and I want you to hear me right now, what that word our does Recognizing the power of our, everybody say our. Our. Recognizing the power of our establishes us in the first required position for kingdom prayers to work, which is unity in the brethren. Brother Lowe says, now think about this, it makes such good sense. I just wasn't smart enough to figure it out on my own. God's prayer promises relate to the whole body because prayer always fulfills a missional function. Now let me break it down for you. You cannot be a part of the body and have a prayer life that doesn't affect the body. We cannot have it both ways. You're either in the body or you're not. You cannot be in the body and have any choices and actions that don't affect the body. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We cannot come to the Lord and offer Him anything unless we're at first right standing within the body. Now, the asking of forgiveness for your brother, oh, Holy Ghost, asking forgiveness for your brother and being right with your brother comes later. But the fact that he is your brother comes now. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Me and my brother may not be getting along just perfect, but he's my brother. Okay. So our, the first thing we acknowledge is we're in the body. Then Jesus taught the disciples to pray in right relationship with God. So when together we address the Father, our Father, we are guaranteed to address Him properly. Because if we're praying to Him as our Father, then we are declaring and recognizing our proper standing as sons and daughters of God. And recognizing, hear me, this is so important right now. Recognizing our place puts emphasis on the relationship, not the prayer. When we are only praying because of needs, the emphasis is on the prayer, not the relationship. You with me? If only we come to him as need, as the need declares, then the only relationship we have with him is as our provider. 
And Brother Chris, when he doesn't provide, we no longer have a relationship. Is that, does that make sense? I, I want you to tell me. If that doesn't make sense, we'll stop right now and unpack it. There we go. That's why people will get in a mess, come to church, hoping to get out of a mess. And if they don't, he ain't even really God no more. But we've got the body established and who I, who I am established. And Sister Dana, who we are and who I am has to be the way it is whether we get any prayers answered or not. Does that, please, please, if it doesn't make sense, raise your hand. Okay. So we got our right and we got father right. But then Jesus taught his disciples the first request in the Lord's prayer is thy kingdom come. Our father, which art in heaven, holy or hallowed or pure be thy name. That's a declaration. And then it says, let your kingdom come, thy kingdom come. Here's why. The kingdom has to come first. And we quoted a lot. We know it was Brother Pete's favorite verse. So, which, by the way, Sister Nadine, I, I don't know why, but it happened again tonight. One of y'all sounds like Brother Pete sometimes through my office door. And it does something to my gizzard when I think I hear it. Now, many of y'all don't know him about Sister Nadine's husband. He's been gone since 2019, but uh, he's not really gone. His, in, his, his presence is still felt. One of y'all sounds like him sometimes. Anyway, the kingdom has to come first. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other. Before your needs are met, the kingdom has to come. Before our daily bread or any of what we feel like are needs, the kingdom must come before repentance to God or asking for forgiveness from another. The kingdom must come before prayer for deliverance from temptation and evil. Recognizing the priority of the kingdom allows all other prayers to be where they belong. The kingdom must be first. Why? I don't have this in my notes, but why? Why does the kingdom have to be first? If he's not top of the line, he's going to be nothing. And when, Brother Chris, when we let it be known he's top of the line, then if he meets the needs, great. And if he doesn't, great. He's still top. He's still God. He's still Lord. That's, I feel Jesus. Ah, that's what Job meant when he said, I came into this world naked, and I'm going out of this world naked. The Lord gave what I had, and the Lord took it away. But blessed be the name of of the Lord. He went on later to say, think about this, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Kingdom. Kingdom. Recognizing you didn't get here because you're smart. You didn't get here. Matter of fact, you had nothing to do with you getting here. Sure. Absolutely. You know, he took his, his self in the flesh. Yes. And said, thy will. Absolutely. Thy will be done. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Let's talk a little bit. This is new stuff to me right here. We're going to talk about the difference in the new birth and adoption. Now, it's the same event, but it's two perspectives of the same event. In John chapter number 3, Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and offered him these two powerful directives from the very same place. John 3 and 3, he said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I don't have time to unpack it, but you don't even get it until you've been born again. It doesn't make sense to you. That's why you need the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because
Because if you try to cipher it without the influence of the Spirit, you're just going to be like an old dog chasing its tail. I'm not calling you a dog. I'm just making that picture. Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then in verse 5 he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So to be born again is to be born of water, which is water baptism in Jesus' name. And to be born of spirit is baptism of the spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now, I know he didn't say the evidence of speaking in other tongues there, but he did in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, and Acts 22. Okay? All right? He did. But you know what I picture and I believe Speaking in other tongues is the cry of a newborn baby. Because you mamas that have had babies and us daddies who've been through this, who've been through the struggle with you. That's a stretch, I know. <laughs> there ain't but one thing you're listening for. I'll let you know all that. So to be born again is to be born of water, which is water baptism in Jesus' name, and spirit, which is the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And when you get filled with the spirit, the, the evidence that the spirit has taken over all of you is when the most messed up part of you begins to speak in a language that you don't know. So we have the new birth, which I, I went and saw a little baby take today, and, and to, to look at the beauty and the, and the perfectness of the Lord, but completely dependent upon his mom and dad. That's what the new birth is. It speaks to total dependence upon God as babies. I don't know if y'all ready for this or not. Next. But we also have something called adoption. And it has a different connotation. You see, in the Roman world, during the time when this was written, babies weren't adopted because they were considered to have no value. Adults were adopted. Children were perceived as having little or no value. Adults, on the other hand, had proven experience and attributes that could be beneficial in carrying on the family responsibility. Adoption was something that was done strategically. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere. Many of the Roman Caesars adopted the next ruler to make sure someone with the right abilities was next in line to lead the empire. If all of his children were knuckleheads, he would go out to the army and find somebody that was smart, that was talented, that was uh, that, that that was a good fighter, that, and he would adopt him as his son. That's why Caesar wasn't nobody's name. It was the leader. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. Look here. So we've got the new birth, which is a baby totally dependent on God. And we've got an adopted adult who's coming to the table. Although we've been called to live a new life and we learn to grow as children, we have the added blessing of having experiences and attributes that allow us to join with the purpose of the kingdom right out of the gate. I don't think that makes sense. Look here. You got the new birth, which is referred to us as babies. How old were you when you got the Holy Ghost? 2014, we'll call it that one. I don't want you to say how old you were in 2014. You're a lady. I know better than that. I'm not that stupid. But she was like 27. Okay. But think about this. When we're born again, no matter if you're 12 or 27 or 53 or 91 or whatever, you're a baby in Christ, right? But you're also a 35-year-old man who's got experiences, who's got knowledge, who's 
got understanding, who's been through some stuff, and you got a testimony. So that means that when the Lord went out to wherever you were yeah. and put his hand on you, Brother Cody, with the muscles, and you showed up at church and said, I got no idea why I'm here. I don't even know if I like you people or not. I'm not sure even why I came here. I don't even know if this is real or not. How in the world did I get here? Now you know. Because the Lord, the Lord, went to the adoption agency of the kingdom, which is called the world. And he said, I want you, and 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 I'm going to let you be born again, and you're going to be a new baby, and it's living for God's stuff, you're going to learn a whole bunch of new stuff, but you're bringing a testimony, and you're bringing some battles, and you're bringing some victories, that the kingdom of God needs Does that make sense? <laughs> Blew my mind. Because y'all know the Lord's been trying to take us there. Yeah. But we don't know if we want to go there. Although we've been called to live a new life. And we have to learn to grow as babies, then children, then adults. We have the added blessing of having experiences and attributes that allow us to join in with the purpose of the kingdom right out of the gate. And that's where kingdom focused prayers come in. Because we learn to pray according to the gifts. And the potential that God has placed in us. We have ceased to exist for our own benefit. And we only exist for the benefit of the kingdom of God. There is no in between. Now I got to hurry. Because I hear you got to the good part of it. Now I want to ask you something. Does anybody know the title? That God gave Abraham. What was Abraham known as? A friend of God. Very good, Sister Nadine. You get a sucker too. <laughs> James 2 and 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. God bless you. Now, look at this. When God, you should have read this in the bread. I'm not going to say how many read the bread, but next time Miss Jane comes, I am going to say that. Because she needs to get to raise her hand. When God decided, please hang with me for a few minutes. All right, I may push it just a little bit tonight. I only got like two pages left, but I may push it. But it's going to be worth it. When God decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, before judgment came, he had a decision to make. Does anybody know what that decision was? Not yet. What'd you say? Not yet. But not yet. Say it again, Brother Blake. Before he went, oh, Holy Ghost, come on now. Y'all got to get this. Before Abraham was called the friend of God, and before, I'm going to this, I, I, I'm going to write a little line. Before he decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, I wonder if I even need to let Abraham know what I'm about to do. You throw that scripture up there for me, your sister. Hiding Genesis 18, 17, 18, and 19. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Who was Abraham? 
Spirit of God. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Abraham's got promise in him. He's got potential in him. There's a plan in him. And it ain't happened yet, but it's going to. For I know him. That he will command his children and his household after him. They'll do what he says. And they'll keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham, which he has spoken of him. The Lord had to make a decision as to whether to share his decision with his friend or not. Everybody say amen. I got it. Amen. Here's why that's important. What are we talking about tonight? What's the title of this lesson? There you go, Brother Blake. Say it loud, man. Don't be shy. Kingdom. Prayers, John 15, 12 through 16. Did I give you that one? Yes. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Next verse. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Don't move on just yet. Who's talking right here? Anybody know? Jesus. Jesus. The only one I know of that has laid down his life like this for his friends. It's the greatest demonstration of love that you have that you lay down your life for his friends. Everybody say his friends. His friends. Next verse. Ye are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Next verse. Henceforth, from now on, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. One more. You have not chosen me. But I picked you. You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to me. Amen. Now, This is why, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I'm about to. This is why we are called, this is why we tonight are calling us to kingdom prayer. Because what we have done most of our lives is Santa Claus prayer. I said, we are calling us tonight to kingdom praying because most of our lives we have practiced Santa Claus praying. Yeah. Several years ago, you'll know about this, Brother Larry. There was a time in my life, just a few years, it feels like a lifetime. I don't talk to him anymore text message once or twice a year. There was a man that was one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. I loved him. We had so much in common. I wanted to be like him. He had the anointing on him, the power of the Holy Ghost on him, but he got sideways. And in my opinion, please forgive me, I know this is going out on TV, but he got some bad advice. He got some bad wisdom, in my opinion. He walked away from God. I had a conversation with him. And he said, you don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss this. And he said to me, and I quote, there is no difference in somebody saying they believe in Jesus Christ 
Can somebody say they believe in Santa Claus? No, I, I know it made that pitiful, hurt my feelings bad, upset me, tore me up. I'm like, oh my goodness, until tonight. And I realized something. Think about it. Think about it. He may be on the list. Check it in twice. Gonna find out if we know you're nice. That's how we pray. Well, think about it. How many of you are scared to go ask God for something when you've been bad? Need something for God, but before you can ask for it, you got to spend 30 minutes repenting for being an idiot. You know, I, I'm telling you the truth. All of us won't admit it, Brother Larry, but we think that way. All these years I've been hurt because I felt like him telling me that wasn't, wasn't fair, that wasn't right. I believe in the living God. I believe in the risen God. And he said there ain't no difference in believing in Jesus and believing in Santa Claus. Brother, the reason why they can say that is because when I testify about him, I testify about him like he is Santa Claus. Come serve my God. You can hop up on his lap and you can tell him all of your needs. You can even have a list. I got one, Brother Johnny. I got one. I pray it every day. I get up there and I say, Lord, I need this. I need you to heal this one. I need you to bless this one. I need you to protect this one. I, I really need, I really need you to listen. I really need you to let me know when the right time to go buy a new truck is. You see, the reason why people think there ain't no difference in Jesus Christ and Santa Claus is because we treat Jesus Christ like Santa Claus. Right. Yeah. The only time we're going to talk to him is when we need something from him. And we'll start off in our prayer pattern, and I'll listen to you pray. Because when I teach a prayer pattern, and then we have a prayer meeting, I hope that you kneel down and start praying your prayer pattern. But you know, you start praying your list. book says he looks at us as friends. Did I not warn you y'all going to get ticked off at me? I warned you. But this is the truth. He looks at us as friends. And what is the identifying characteristic of a friend of God? He shares things with you. Is that not what it said? Abraham was a friend of God. And he said, reckon I ought to tell Abraham what I'm going to do. The reason why he didn't know about telling him what he was going to do, because he knew Abraham was going to, whenever Abraham heard the plan of God, Abraham was going to work. Intercession. Right? What did Abraham do? Can you find 50? The Lord said, yep. He said, well, if that's the case, how about 45? All the way down to 10. That was Abraham's business. And the Lord said, yes. Because Abraham was a friend of God. But here. What would happen if we would stop praying to Jesus like he was Santa Claus. And start praying to him like he was our commander. And we were his friends. And when we come together, we're coming together to make strategy. And we're coming together to make plans. And we're coming together to form action. We're coming together that me and him are now doing the same thing. And if that, if I believe that the Bible is true, if I do it his way, I'm going to have enough to eat. I'm going to have something to live in. I'm going to have clothes to wear. I'm going to have something to drive. My kids are going to be well. My family's going to be safe. You see, we spend all our time asking for 
find things that are supposed to be at the end. He promised that if we would seek first the kingdom, that everything we needed would be added to us. Right order equals right provision. But I'm scared if I don't pray for him, he won't answer. He said, whatever you, whatever you ask, I'll give it to you. You see, the problem, Logan, is we've been asking for the wrong thing. We've been supposed to be praying for the kingdom to come. And we've been praying for all these other things to happen. And some of us have been praying for years and years and years. And we don't even really feel nothing when we do pray about it. And the reason is, we got everything. We got everything out of order. God is doing something new and powerful. I'm coming to close. He's doing something new and powerful, and it scares some of us. I said it scares some of us. I've been getting lit up by people who don't even come to church no more. And at first it was hurt my feelings. I just don't know why it's hurting my feelings. Because of teaching the things I'm teaching. Because you see, Brother Blake, people that don't want to do right want things to stay the same. Because yeah. yeah. there ain't no challenge. Because we have we know when to sing, we know when to stand, we know when to clap, we know when to, to talk in tongues. We know when to give. We know when to do everything. We can just keep on. And we have good church. And we know how to do it right. But we're just too scared. Yeah. Who's on the phone? Yeah. God's doing a new thing. It is new. It is scary. It does challenge us. But we live in a new world. We live in a world that's going to pieces. We live in a world where the inmates are running the asylum. It scares us and it intimidates us. But he's going to do something, there's no doubt. What kind of a revival can we have? If we'll hush long enough for him to share his plan with us and then empower us to bring his plan to pass. Many of the things we pray for It was a great day when I found enough things to ask God for that would last 45 minutes or an hour. Because you see, Brother Blake, the truth is, we don't really know how to talk to him unless it's about our needs. We can even start out doing it right and zone out and the next thing you know, we're praying for our needs for 20 minutes. <laughs> right back there again. Because you know something, Brother Bonnie? I don't trust him to keep his word. Now the committees have already done the work. It's right here. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The one in my head that says, well, I'm going to say this on the Brother Arnold. He told me, Brother Larry, he said, Brother, I come home from every one of them meetings. And I feel like I done ruined everything. I done made everybody mad. I done upset everybody. Ain't nobody gonna come ask me to preach no more. 
Because you see, Brother Christian, when the anointing is gone, it's gone. And he don't come and hold our hand and pat us on the head and powder our proverbial body. But he's looking for a few good men and women Amen. who can overcome the challenge. Because if you weren't ever challenged in the word before tonight, you have been. Consider yourself challenged. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I come before you right now because I love you. I believe in the power of your word. I believe in what you're trying to do to us, for us. I believe, God, that the things you are laying out ahead of us are div divinely ordained and orchestrated. I believe, God, you're calling us to prayer lives of a magnitude and a dimension that we didn't even know existed. Not that we just couldn't get there. We didn't even know it existed. But, Lord, your word is alive, and it's quick, and it's powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides, and it cuts, and it, it molds, and it shapes, and you're working on us. And I'm thankful for that. I pray, God, that what we said tonight and over the last few nights, I don't want it to leave my mind. I pray, Lord, that you that you use the word on me, mold me, and shape me with the word. I, I pray, God, upset my sleep time, upset my dinner time, upset my traveling time, upset my schedule. Lord, I, I, I surrender to you, Lord Jesus, because I want this. I want this. I've got a glimpse of the promised land, and I want to be ready to go. Take your hand out and hold with me. 